Let me go back a little bit. Um, what was your initial reaction upon receiving the phone call, you know, that Jason was, was in the hospital there? I was robotic. I really didn't, I remember just going through the motions of getting my things together, calling a car. I was living in Brooklyn and the hospital was in Manhattan. Called a car. Monica had asked me to bring a sweater because the hospital was cold and I forgot and I had the car go back and, you know, I said some prayers and I just was really trying not to be, not to let fear take hold of me and just wait and see. You know, I didn't want to freak out before uh, needing to freak out. Then at the ER, the neurosurgeon came out and said, uh, there's been a bleed in his brain and, and the damage is severe and he's probably not going to survive until tomorrow. And even if he does, his neurological prognosis is very poor because the neurosurgeon said when we pinch Jason, he turns his arm like this instead of grabbing for the pain. So in this very rudimentary way, they were measuring Jason's neurological uh, prognosis and, and saying that there wasn't much there of the man that we knew and loved. And then I fell apart. Uh, and, but then the next day, Jason was alive. And in fact, I, he was intubated. So he had a tube going down his, his throat to breathe for him in case, in case his lungs had collapsed or he'd stopped breathing. So they had intubated him. And he woke up. And uh, I put a pen in his hand and I held up my journal under his hand and he wrote, tell me. He's like, tell me what's going on. Tell me what happened. And so then we knew that his neurological prognosis couldn't be that bad if he was wondering what was going on and he could hold a pen and he could write, tell me. So that was, so that was, so then it was like, all right, we got to just take this one day at a time, you know, uh, not get too crazy, not count on anything, just take it, you know, he's alive, he can communicate, you know, it just really was a question of what do we have, focusing on what do we have, not what do we not have, what do we, you know. Well, Jason, you know, this, this whole process, you know, you've lost, you know, you said you had lost, you know, a year and a half of your life that you just really don't remember. Um, what made you, though, want to, you know, get back up to speed? Um, you know, I, I, I can remember when I was in high school, I was on the track team, and I ran the quarter mile. And I was really good at the quarter mile. And anyone who's run the quarter mile knows that it's just, it's a real pain to run it because it's not quite a sprint, but it's not quite a distance. It's somewhere in the middle, and it's really tricky to do it well. And my way of doing it was I would run, and usually there'd be somebody in front of me from the other team, and then in the very end of it, which is the part in which you really have the most trouble, you feel your legs just start to cave, I would just get so determined to get the guy in front of me that at the very end I would just power ahead of him and I, I would just feel this sort of explosion of energy and uh, inertia just rocket me ahead of this guy and there's something about that energy and that spirit that exists in me that I think was present even in the earliest days of Recovering from this, there's just something in me that just drives me to to get to the next point, you know, at, at wherever I'm at, you know. And so, you know, there's video footage of me at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital trying to put a cone on top of a pole, and, and it was just the hardest thing in the world for me. But I would just keep going, trying to get the, the cone up there. And so it's been like that throughout. There's something inside me that's just very determined to get to the next place. And you know, as we talk about in our presentation, there were many motivators. You know, my family was a huge motivator, having them around me. Ellie, my newborn daughter, was an incredible motivator because she was just so beautiful and so full of life and so happy. Uh, music was a huge motivator. So there were these things that, that made me want to 
you know, return to a productive, independent life. At, at any point, you know, during this, did you feel sorry for yourself or? Um, yeah, I, I had, I definitely, of course, had periods of feeling depressed that it happened, angry that it happened, frustrated. You go through those things, that's normal, that's human, you know, it's, it's how you deal with those feelings that is the real important stuff, you know. I, I think it would be crazy to not feel stuff like that, and I, I did feel things like that, but I didn't, I didn't let it overwhelm me for too long, you know. I would, I would sort of realize that, that staying in that kind of a state is just, is, is unproductive. Right. Well, um, what kind of advice would you offer to anyone who's faced with any type of adversity, especially along these lines? I mean... I would say, you know, to the best of your ability, surround yourself with people who truly love you. Uh, because that's going to just help you to dig deeper and to to use the things in your life that you love as motivators as as best you can. Um, I know that's that's what worked for me. You know, I had my family and and close friends around me throughout the whole thing, and and uh, I had music to to come back to. Well, Marjorie, let me ask you the same question. What advice would you offer to someone, you know, who's with you know, a family member, loved one who is facing this adversity? What kind of advice do you have to offer? I would say listen to your gut instinct. We had a lot of people in the medical community uh, say to us, Jason's not going to walk again. He's not going to play the guitar again. And we couldn't look into a crystal ball and see what was going to happen in the future, but we gave it a chance. You know, we we gave ev we gave Jason every opportunity to get up and go again, and he did. It may not have turned out that way, but we fought for that opportunity to to maybe happen, and it did. So there were a lot of times along the way when uh, I think we could have given in to fear or doubts or people saying no. And every day we saw a little bit of progress in Jason. And every day we saw a little bit of Jason. We saw the guy that we knew. And even when he was immobile and mostly non-responsive, he would rise up to the surface with just a little, you know, raising his eyebrows in response to something we said, or here's an example. One time we were listening to a, a radio show and there was this um, guy playing the guitar singing the blues. And I couldn't identify who it was. And I said to Jason, is it, is it this guy? And he said, I said, close your eyes if it's this guy. Didn't close his eyes. I said, is it this guy? Close your eyes if it's this guy. Didn't close his eyes. And I said, close your eyes if you know who this is. And very slowly, Jason's eyes closed. And he wasn't able to tell me who it was. He wasn't communicating that much. Robert but Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> no, I asked you if it was Robert Johnson. He knows now. Right. Anyway, it was these very minute signs that could have been dismissed, but I and the rest of our family believed that, that it was signs that, it was, that Jason was there. So I would say listen to your gut instinct. All right, well, thank you both for being here. Thank you, Mr. Krigler. Um, and uh, we'll be back in just a moment to wrap up Direction Northeast. I don't train like you. I don't have the same skin as you. I don't wear my hair like you. I don't dance like you. I don't come from the same place as you. But I will give you CPR. When you help the American Red Cross, you help America. That concludes the program for today. We met Jason Krigler and learned how this musician battled back from a debilitating stroke 
and found a chord that resonated around the world. Thanks again to our guest for this program, Mr. Jason Krigler. Community is very important to the students at Northeast State Community College, and this program takes a look at a few of the subjects they find important. We encourage you to get out and explore the natural beauty of our region and be aware of all the issues concerning your community. Until we meet next time, on behalf of the students, staff, and faculty of Northeast State Community College, I'm Chris Mitchell, and this is Direction Northeast. Thank you.